harassment by police, harassment of the bars. So here we have the billy clubs and the handcuffs. Uh, also an interesting piece here that in Provincetown in the 1950s and 60s, you could be arrested if you didn't have three gender conforming pieces of clothing on. Uh, so this does show how the fight for uh, lesbian gay rights really goes along the fight for expression of gender identity, uh, the ability to wear the clothes and express your gender the way you wanted. Uh, so we, we make this point too that the criminalization and the treatment of homosexual citizens had a lot to do with gender identity too. You may know Mike Wallace's voice. Uh, oh, yes, I remember. Oh, yeah. This is a documentary from 1967 called The Homosexuals. It captures the mood of the 1950s and 60s attitude uh, towards homosexual folks. And you know, we did just recently, after the exhibit opened, find it an even earlier documentary from the early 60s in San Francisco. But this is one of the first. Uh, and Mike Wallace, you know, for the time, it was considered a, a friendly treatment of homosexual citizens. But if you listen to it, some of these medical critiques come up, uh, certainly the criminal issues are raised, but they actually interview uh, uh, gay citizens in this uh, particular documentary, which was powerful, and Mike Wallace was really viewed as a trustworthy source, so we, we actually did a lot of work to make sure we got an actual Magnavox TV from the era, and one of the exciting things about this TV was converted to be digital, so that we can show uh, digital documentaries on it. This documentary. Yes, it is, it's no doubt. Uh, it's homophobic for the era, and, and we actually use this to distinguish what you'll see later on the TV shows we show from the modern era, which really show through the hard work of LGBT activists and their allies, the transformation from this homophobic attitude towards the very positive attitude we see in TV nowadays. If we can bring folks around, this is the Frank Kameny section. You should go okay. over this Frank was an incredible letter writer. Yes, indeed. Uh, he wrote letters about just about any case that came in front of him, and he, he very bravely wrote his own uh, uh, case for the Supreme Court, and you can see that up on the wall here. He wrote his own petition uh, for a writ of certiorari. You can all come in. Yeah, come on around, take a look. One of the things we found is that the youth are most fascinated by this typewriter because they're not used to typewriters. Uh, he was a World War II and veteran. And he capitalized yeah, things. Yeah, Randy's you know. pointing out that he was a, a World War II veteran and he was really arguing for full citizenship for LGBT people very boldly when that couldn't have even been imagined. And it came out of the fact that he fought for his country in World War II and he just he felt there was no way he could be denied that full citizenship because he was so courageous. And I know Lillian Faderman's gonna talk a little more, more about him later today in today's presentation. But a really visionary, prescient person. And this is one of the incredible things about both Frank Kameny, Barbara Giddings, and many of the pioneers with us today is that they imagined the world that exists today, 50 years ago, when there was very little reason to imagine that it could ever be brought into reality. So the courage that's involved in that, but the brilliance too, the brilliance that imagines a world that doesn't exist and begins to put in place what's necessary to get us there. So whether that was the demonstrations in front of Independence Hall, whether it was that fight in front of the APA to make sure the gay people were no longer viewed as diseased, uh, whether it was the fight against the AIDS epidemic subsequently, you know, a major uh, challenge that our communities faced and brought us together to create new organizations and institutions. All of these came out of the fact that LGBT activists and our allies had the brilliance to imagine a world where we were treated as full citizens. And we, we had a full taste of that last Friday. There's a lot more work to be done. And part of what this exhibit talks about is that as you go through the decades, a civil rights battle builds upon the successes of the past. There are two steps forward, sometimes one step back, uh, but that it's a steady progression. And the arc of full equality is definitely in our uh, favor at the moment. So these are the demonstrations in front of Independence Hall, these annual reminders I've mentioned up to now. And uh, here you see Frank Kameny uh, handing out flyers. And you know the power of con having conversation with the men and women who are around and watching the demonstration. How much courage it took to have that conversation and that people were open to it. And one of the cool things about this part of the exhibit is we see the comments, you know, a businessman saying that's an impressive looking picket line. A mother of five saying you should all be married and have a family. Uh, so some you know, points of view on all sides. High school student, they look so normal. You can always count on the youth to have uh, more visionary and positive views than sometimes their elders. 
A policeman, hey, that's a good looking group, I'm surprised. A dowager, how dare they show their faces. Uh, so a whole range of, uh, and these were actually published uh, in the September 1965 issue of The Ladder. And The Ladder was the first lesbian periodical, and Barbara Giddings was the editor of the Philadelphia uh, part of The Ladder, but it was a national periodical. And one of the things that I'll say about this exhibit is when we originally envisioned it three years ago, it was to focus on the power of archives, and in particular, the Jack Wilcox archives at the William Way LGBT Community Center. And there are a number of these LGBT archives across the country, the One Archives in LA, there's an archives at the New York LGBT Center and the New York Public Library, archives in Chicago, and this one in Philadelphia that have documented our history for all these years and you know and made sure that we keep that history and that it's available for community activists for scholars so that these stories can continu continue to be told and one of the magic things about going into that archives is that we still pull out treasures we still find things today that we didn't know about our history so we encourage you to come by the William Way archives uh, to take a look at all that it has to offer we also published the Mattachine Review. That's right. Uh, there were 17 issues, and we sent it to the FBI director, J. And the FBI contacted us and asked us to stop sending it to over. That's great. <laughs> Paul just mentioned that the Mattachine Review, uh, which moved at, uh, came out of the Mattachine movement, uh, was sent to the FBI, in particular to J. Edgar Hoover. And at some point, he said, please stop sending it to me. <laughs> so, you know, there was also this ability to realize what are the right targets, making sure that. J. Edgar Hoover, who was one of the major opponents, uh, and many of you know that he, his own sexuality and gender identity is sometimes questioned, and so, you know, so that the, he was confronted. And these arguments were brought to the Supreme Court. These arguments were brought to legislators on the local, state, and federal level. And the courage that it took to do that, knowing, as we do know, that the FBI often would then go after those folks who had the courage to speak the truth. For the event, I wore my original Love the Medicine button. <laughs> That's right. From yeah. the 1960s. That's one point we put out metal buttons that just said M, which if you would turn it upstairs would up, up, upside down would be wheels. And somehow some of the stuff down on Wall Street, other people would see M and know who we were. But it didn't really work. It didn't last long. But this, <laughs> this one has stood the test of time. I love the Mattachino. I'm the last Mattachino. We always so say that speak. Randy's one of the last Mattachinos because he continues to fight for the rights of folks who do not have a voice. So he, he's been fighting for Russian LGBT citizens on the international level. He's been Sunday. fighting for LGBT homeless youth. And one of the things we see about many of these lifetime activists, John James, an AIDS activist who created one of the first AIDS periodicals in the country and continues to be an act of, ad, advocate for LGBT elders. Uh, you know, many of these activists have taken on this work as a lifetime commitment. And a victory does not mean they stop their work. And I think that is a real lesson for all of us as we continue. And as all you know, the camera has replaced the pen. That's right. And thank you for continuing to document. <laughs> I don't want to show you serious about that, but I appreciate the thought. <laughs> We're going to go into the central area next, please. John, come on. You're the honored guest here. You didn't walk, you didn't walk in. <laughs> sit, why did you sit in my chair? Where's Chris? Oh, there is. Okay. Uh -huh. I'll take you on this side. Okay. To me, this is a very moving section of the... Uh, of the uh, display. And uh, one we thing we were asked to do by the National Constitution Center was to give voice to our opponents. And at first we were frustrated because we thought if you were to do a, a, a exhibit on African American civil rights or women's civil rights, you might not give a voice to the opponents. But as we began to think, we thought it actually brought power to talk about our opponents in, in large part because so many of the opponents' points of view seem antiquated and, uh, and to be left behind. That's one view of them. But they also seem very current in that, you know, the right wing continues to pull up these arguments in the present. So we have Anita Bryant here. Uh, you know, in the, in the Anita Bryant campaigns in the, left set in the late 70s really worked nationwide in a number of cities to try to repeal gay rights uh, laws, uh, starting in Miami but in many other cities. And this was viewed as you know, really the first time the Christian coalition began to come together to confront the incredible successes, and it really spoke to the success the LGBT movement was having in the 70s, coming out of Snowball, coming out of Gay Liberation Front, Gay Activist Alliance, and in many of these cities, a growing recognition of the visibility of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender citizens. So that visibility led to a backlash. And uh, Anita Bryant was uh, 
the voice for Orange Juice. She was a uh, voice for Florida Orange Juice. She was also a very popular singer. And she began a movement uh, that did take some energy. And the activists responded by punching holes in frozen orange juice cans, uh, confronting her uh, wherever she went. And they managed to succeed in uh, you know, addressing that issue and making sure that it was minimized. Uh, but she was a very important voice. And also, you know, Jerry Falwell was another one. Uh, these voices that came out in the era of Reagan, pre-Reagan and then during Reagan, uh, to begin to confront the successes that we were having as a movement. So we think it was important to give voice to these, really so that you can also see that many of the arguments are similar today. Uh, you know, if gays are granted nights, next we'll have to give rights to prostitutes and to people who sleep with St. Bernard's and to nail biters. That was one of her famous quotes. Uh, they probably don't give the same examples today of who we'd have to give rights to, but you often hear that argument that we give, to, you know, as if they're these, only a certain number of rights, and if we give away too many of them, we're going to run out of them. Uh, so that's been a long-standing argument. Jerry Falwell, if our nation legally recognizes homosexuality, we will put ourselves under the same hand of judgment as Sodom and Gomorrah. 